take a moment to appreciate the support that each one of us gives to and gets from each other. And just take a moment to let the goodness of that sink in. Feeling the, the warmth in this virtual community this evening. The good intentions we have for ourselves and for all other beings. And appreciating that each one of us was able to get here this evening. Because so often in our lives, we have these really good intentions to, to do something that's really supportive for ourselves, to practice, to offer loving kindness, to come together. And, you know, just the, the busyness of life gets in the way. So it's really a cause for gladness when we're actually able to follow through on our intention. So just take that in for a moment. And just notice how that appreciation feels in the body. Rick Hansen, the wonderful Buddhist psychologist, has often said that we, we sort of have Velcro for the negative, that we take that to heart, it sticks with us. But we, to mix a metaphor, kind of have Teflon for the good, that we don't always take in the good. So really, this evening, take in the good that you've come to practice, to get support, to give support. And I would encourage you to bring your whole selves into the room, not just the meditator, but our whole selves, welcoming, welcoming all. So we can have the irritable and impatient parts the sad parts, the happy parts. Our whole selves are welcome here. No matter how distracted the mind is, it's welcome. And how restless the body, it's welcome. The wonderful meditation teacher, Sylvia Borstein, told some graduate students when they asked her what she wanted her mind to be like. She said she wanted her mind to be like Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, where everyone is safe, everyone is welcome, people can have their feelings, and it's all okay. And I think that's a a really lovely aspiration that our minds are as friendly and opening and safe as Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. So as we sit together this evening, I would encourage you just to notice if there's any striving going on. 
if there's any sense of needing to do it right. It's fine to have aspirations. And when those aspirations turn into striving, it's a source of stress. So I would encourage you as much as, <coughs> pardon me, as much as possible to gently let go of any striving. And you can welcome the striving mind and just keep it company. So see if it's possible to have a relaxed and receptive awareness. An awareness rooted in the body. An awareness that might be supported by the breath, noticing the breath. Just a spacious, receptive awareness that sees the movement of nature, that sees what arises and passes away in the body, in the mind, and just has this kindly, receptive attention. And letting this practice be a time of kindness toward ourselves, kind intentions toward others, and as best we can, trusting, trusting that this receptivity, this awareness, these good intentions, that this is enough. That we can be ourselves here fully in the moment, fully receptive, fully attentive. And now let's practice in silence.
And for the last minute or two of our meditation tonight, see if you can just invite a felt sense of appreciation or gratitude. And just let the mind and the body be with that. So please take a minute, as we always do, to sort of stretch or um, move around a little bit and um, we'll resume in just, just about a minute. And um, when you come back, if you could turn your camera on for a little bit, that's always great to see each other. Is there anyone here tonight who's uh, here to this group for the first time? And if you are, could you just unmute yourself and say hello? Well, what I thought I would share with you um, this evening are some thoughts and reflections that I've had on sort of three interrelated um, topics, um, interdependence, relationality, and something called the platinum rule. And a lot of this was inspired by a new book that's come out called Casting Indra's Net. And for those of you who remember Ayo Yutundi, who was at 
living in the Twin Cities for a while and teaching at United Theological. This is a new book by Io, and it's called Casting Indra's Net. And the subtitle is Fostering Spiritual Kinship and Community. And then the sub subtitle is Wisdom from Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, and more. And Io is um, a great Dharma teacher, a great practitioner, a pastoral counselor, chaplain, and so much of Io's work has focused on developing relationships, um, working for social justice, and really understanding the importance of really grasping our our interdependence and I have believed for a long time and some of you have heard me say this before that I think the most important thing about us as human beings is our capacity for care none of us would be here tonight if an individual or more likely a group of individuals hadn't made the effort to keep us alive when we were young you know we are so dependent on the care of others and what is i think remarkable about our species is that we are so primed to care i mean that is you know you, you can hear sometimes people talk about competition and all that but actually the most important thing about us is as a species is our tremendous capacity to care and to care about those who are biologically related to us and those who are not we are essentially a caring species i mean we're not the only one a lot of other primates a lot of other mammals have um, a lot of caring capacity but human beings have a, a tremendous capacity to uh, to care. And I think this is, is something that really should be in the forefront of our consciousness. You know, when we do our loving kindness practice, what we're doing in that is we are intending to abandon as best we can, ultimately abandon ill will and to really cultivate a very wholesome concern for the well-being of ourselves and the well-being of others. It is essentially a, a caring relational practice. And as I now have been practicing for decades, what has come more and more to be the, the core of my own practice are these relational practices, the practice of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity, that recognizing our, our interdependence, um, recognizing that our actions always have consequences for ourselves and often have consequences for, for others. So we, we live in this extremely interdependent world and when we just you know reflect on all the sorts of ways on which we count on each other just to get through the day that um that there um that there's food at the at the grocery store that we can um go to a doctor i mean all these sorts of things that when we think about that when we um when we're driving across a bridge that the engineers who have you know put the bridge together were careful about what they did that the people who are maintaining the bridge you know that we, we are so dependent on on the on each other we live in this incredible web of of interdependence and um our survival both for our physical and our spiritual lives are really dependent on each other. If we think about um, the persons who have inspired us, whether we we know them or or not, I mean, I often think about you know, Jane Goodall and the Dalai Lama and the wonderful 
Buddhist philosopher Joanna Macy, you know, people whose lives I just think of oh, these people really inspire me that they've had a tremendous impact on uh, my sense of what, how it's possible for a person to be. Uh, and then all the, the wonderful teachers um, that, that I've had. So you know, I'm, I'm just so aware of relational practice that my Dharma practice, even my, mindful, my mindfulness practice has an effect not only on me, but on all the beings I, I interact with. Not just the meta practice, but the mindfulness practice, because I really need that mindfulness practice often to, uh, to ground me in this body and in this, in this moment. And the platinum rule, which is, was new to me, and this is Io's, one of Io's many brilliant ideas. She said, you know, we need to go beyond the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Because in that one, we take ourselves as a template. And so um, we treat others as if they were just like us. And it's really important for all of us with curiosity and humility to really investigate this both sameness and and different and thinking that we know what another wants because it's what we want or um, just that that sort of um, narcissism is, is, is much too strong a word, but that, that idea that we take ourselves as, as a template. And Io's idea about the platinum rule is that, and it's, it's a little complex, it's a little tricky, it's to treat others as they need to be treated for their ultimate well-being not simply as they would wish to be treated. I'll say that again, because it, it's, you, you can tell it's something that is um, is a, a, a sophisticated idea. Treat others as they need to be treated for their ultimate well-being, not simply as they want to be treated. And the example might be that someone might say to you, I just want you to leave me alone. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Don't tell me that this happened. I don't, I don't want to know. And you might think, well, this is something you really need to know about. You know, this is for, for your own well-being to know about this. So it could be something, uh, I'll try to think of something in the news like, vaping okay that may be vaping thought to be harmless seems to maybe be more harmful than initially so you know you tell your teenager you know this is this is not something that is is good for you is for your ultimate well-being person i don't want to know leave me alone so that's kind of a very a very simple example but you know if we don't hold ourselves as a template and we try to imagine what is, how do we treat people for their ultimate well-being, which is our meta practice, right? We want to, to bring about the, um, the well-being of another, but what is the ultimate well-being for ourselves and for others? And as I tried to think about this in, you know, in, in ways that were more challenging, I think, okay, so for example, with my pets, I make assumptions about them for their ultimate well-being. And many of us do. Like we control their reproduction, we control the food they eat, we control the exercise they get. We are, and often at great cost, great um, 
it's often for many of us, like really a matter of conscience, like what is the best thing for this beloved animal at this time, right? So, I mean, we, we've had experience, many of us, where we do make judgments about what's for the ultimate well-being. If we've had children, we've often um, made choices about, you know, what is for their ultimate well-being, not just what's convenient right now, what would be kind of the easy thing to do, but what is, is going to be something that is for their, their ultimate well-being. We're not, and um, sometimes we're not treating them in the way they want to be treated in that moment because that's not conducive to their ultimate well-being. Um, a much trickier arena would be, for example, vulnerable adults. And there is a very interesting um, court case now in California about treating people who appear to have mental illness, who don't share the same beliefs as a lot of other people. And the example was this person said, my son believes that Bill Clinton and I established a trust fund for him and we won't, if only we would give him that money, everything would be fine. But there is no, she doesn't know Bill Clinton, there's no money. And this person is living on the street and is refusing to seek any sort of care. This person doesn't believe that he needs care, that he just needs the money that his mother is not giving him. And there's, there's this really interesting question because this person has not harmed anyone except maybe himself. But, um, you know, so the, the question in the courts right now is whether or not there is any right to intervene. I mean, and these are the sorts of, of, of questions that Many of us face in maybe less dramatic sorts of ways, but in our families, with our friends, when is it appropriate to, to intervene? And if we take this platinum rule, it really brings this very much home about how do we act, how do we treat another for their own ultimate well-being? Um, and, and I think this is <clears throat> is a very um, fruitful area. Io, in her book, focuses primarily on people who hold different religious views, different sort of cultural views, and talks about uh, really bringing a lot of um, humility and curiosity and willingness to learn in trying to live with the platinum rule. And I've, I've just found it, since I, I read the book a few weeks ago, it has just been such a conundrum for me in, in a way, because we, we know examples of people who very, um, are very patronizing, very patriarchal in, um, you know, I know what's best for you, sweetie, don't worry your pretty little head. I know what's best for you. You know, that's sort of real patronizing. So we, we never want to patronize. You know, we want to have this real um, humility and curiosity, but we also, you know, because we're in this interdependent web, it's not like it's just okay for you to go off and um, be really terrible to yourself in a way. Because, I mean, one of the things that we we know now is that one of the great um, deterrents to human health is loneliness, is, you know, that that's something that keeps so many people from flourishing. So if someone says, I just want to be left alone, someone you care about, um, someone who's just totally isolating. What is our obligation? 
in in those sorts of circumstances. And it's, I mean, this is not easy. This is really where our, our practice kind of um, really comes down to because we really need to bring that sort of mindfulness, really paying attention, really observing, really being curious, really be, being willing to be wrong. You know, this is, this is not, um, it is not an easy um, rule to, to apply. You know, we, um, I also said we should be seeing every other person, every person as kin. I mean, that's the kind of goal of this book, that we, we look at everyone with this relationship of kin. Or uh, Valerie Carr, who is um, a wonderful um, activist and wrote the book Revolutionary Love, is uh, a sick. And she said, you know, that the earliest rule she learned as a child from her grandfather was the idea, see no stranger. And apparently this is something that's practiced in the Sikh religion, that the idea is see no stranger, that everyone you meet, everyone you, who's there is just someone you haven't gotten to know yet. So they are not, no one is, is a stranger. See another as kin. Um, and so um, this has been something that, um, I, I love this idea about see no stranger. You know, all the people we haven't haven't yet met, to see no stranger, to wish well for them, to wish for their their ultimate um, well being. And then there is even a further you know, complication in is something I've been thinking about. Um, I recently read a book by the um, Oxford philosopher William McCaskill called What Do We Owe the Future? And it is all about the moral decisions that we make now that will affect future generations. And this again is, uh, you know, how do we treat, how do we act as if we're treating future generations? What are we, um, what is in their best interest, in their interest of of flourishing, and that that might be one way to understand um, ultimate well-being. The um, the secular Buddhist writer Stephen Batchelor talks about the goal as human flourishing in secular Buddhism. That's one of the ideas that they talk about. You know, what what is it to have human flourishing? So that might be something just to to think about as we think about another's well-being. Um, what would it mean for, for others to really flourish? And how should we treat them to do that? And maybe what do we renounce so that others can flourish? I mean, if, if we think about the ways we consume, for example, what might we need to, um, to renounce, to give up so that others can flourish? And these are, are I think, um, really interesting dharmic questions that really do um, spring out of our, our practice and our, our good intentions. Um, so um, I don't know, I, 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 what I really wanted to do is have a, a discussion, have us have a, a discussion tonight about this because it it seems that as we we're, we've been working through the eightfold path and the eightfold path um, is you know it's about wisdom and morality and mental development but it really is all of a piece and when we think about um, applying the eightfold path how we live the eightfold path it is um, treating ourselves for our ultimate well-being, but also treating others for their ultimate well-being and not having the sort of arrogance to take ourselves as the template, being open to the possibility that for others to flourish, 
there may be some very different sorts of um, conditions. So I hope that that's something that interests you and you have things to say about it or questions or responses. And I would encourage you, Io's book is very, um, very readable. And again, it's called Casting Indra's Net. And it's, it's a paperback um, and pretty accessible. So I'd love to hear your, your thoughts and responses. So just unmute yourself and chime in. Hi, thank you, Patrice. Um, the book you spoke about, not I, it was the other book, McCaskill. Mm -hmm. I gave it to a friend, a very close friend to read and he gave it back to me. I haven't started reading it yet, but I heard a discussion on public radio about a year ago, maybe two years ago, mm -hmm. that really uh, perked my interest. It's, that's why I bought the book for my friend and he in turn has given it back to me. Um, and it's about effective altruism, which I thought is a great phrase. Um, again, I haven't read it yet. Um, I had an incident today that really, really jarred me. Um, a mother in the news, a mother finally got the videotape for her daughter who had been murdered by her partner. And why she got the videotape is the police were called they came to her house, uh, they knocked on the door, uh, and then they walked away. Well, what upset me about that is somehow the police got a, a when I was living in, in a two family house, I was living upstairs, the police, I got home and the door was broken down and I went upstairs, I didn't know what happened. Uh, and uh, there was a notice from the police department. So I called them. And a very uh, testy officer, because I was asking a question, why did they break the door now? He said, well, they got a 911 call from my apartment, my number. And because it was a hang up call, nobody responded when they got to the door, they broke it down and went in. So why didn't they do that if they had no answer for this woman who had called? There was a 911 or call, oh, definitely, two. and I was really upset by that because I broke my door down and I wasn't home. Uh, and I did not have a, a message like that, I didn't have anything like that. And I mean, that it was my landlord's door and he had to replace it, but I was livid when I heard today's story, I just couldn't get my mind off of it, and it upsets me a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they need to be accountable. I hope, that, you know, they can't bring back her daughter, but she wins. You know. So my story and her story are similar. I come out wondering why, and she's, her mother's wondering why. Where do we go from there? Those are really hard stories. Yeah, I, um, I heard that, that um, recently that, that someone's, you know, kid dialed 911 and the person called back and said that was, you know, that was an accident, but the police still came out. So, you know, that may be um, training now that people have. I, I, don't, I don't know, Robert, but I, I think that I, it may be more and more that there is a responsibility to check it out, even if someone says, this was just an, an accident because someone could say that in in a time when someone may be calling with a serious, um, you know, whose safety is imperiled. Yeah, this this happened a while back. Mm -hmm. um, and she finally, the, why it's news today is because after a long effort to get the videotape, she's finally gotten it. Mm -hmm. And we're watching, I'm watching it. And the police goes up to the door, he knocks on the door, looks over to the window. Um, and all I could see is he turned away. I wish I could have seen more so that I could understand more fully, but I was like, okay, this is wrong. But, and, and we, 
you know, I, I don't know how it, we can't judge what happens. In, I mean, we just don't know. But one of the things that is helpful is when we have a culture where we can go over our mistakes and learn from them. And um, I'm trying to remember what it's what it's called, but someone told me about, I don't know if, uh, I think it's called the gotchas. And I, I think it's at Mayo, but I'm not sure what, what hospital system uses it. But a doctor talked about that, that whenever someone like, they almost made a mistake and they just caught it in time, like, I'm just gonna check that over that they would report that at their staff meeting and it would be celebrated. You know, this was a culture in which people could talk about, I almost made this mistake and someone caught it or I caught it. But you know, when we have a culture where we can talk about the, the, mis the mistakes we've actually made, the mistakes we almost made, when there is that much safety, I mean, this is really about community, right? Because community is really about safety in a way. When we feel safe enough to tell each other what went wrong, what we almost did, and we can all learn from it, that's a great thing. I mean, that's how, you know, like that story, someone said, well, I didn't hear anything, I didn't see anything, so I left. And then this terrible tragedy happened. Well, that's something to learn from. It's not to punish the people. It's, it's a, okay, we can all learn from this. And I think that's a lot about this idea about developing relationality, being a community, um, understanding safety um, as not just the absence of kind of immediate harm, but this culture of safety in which we can talk about what we almost did, and even in, in a Dharma sense, sometimes in when I'm with a practice group and we're all talking about sort of how we how we messed up, um, particularly in a practice group that I'm I'm in where we talk about whiteness um, and talk about and it's a really safe place to do that because we all trust each other. But it, it's, and I think it's something for all of us to aspire to. Um, you know, someone said that one of the greatest compliments people can give you is that you're a safe person to be around. And, um, you know, that's really something that when we can have our, our communities feel like they're, they're safe spaces, that we can bring our whole selves into the room and and it's okay and we can learn from each other and we can see no stranger we can see each other as kin that's that is i think such a a beautiful aspiration and completely um in alignment with our our meta practice about wishing for you know cultivating that wholesome concern for ourselves and others other comments that people have. Well, Patrice, I really appreciated your launching this topic of discussion and it's it's provocative to think about going beyond what we might otherwise assume is okay and be a little bit more assertive about something that we see, even if the subject of our concern doesn't acknowledge that need. Because I, I think our culture kind of tells us to, you know, we can offer, we can keep the door open, but we can't push too hard. And 
and and as someone who um, studied social work, I remember with such embarrassment the the stories of the early part of that profession of do gooder women going out into communities and doing things that they thought were were good for people that were really awful, you know, intrusive things to do. So that example just came to mind as you were talking about it, you know, like, wow, we really do have to be so careful, not think that we know what another person needs. But I appreciate the invitation to think more openly about that or more carefully about, about that. Thanks, Paula. Uh, and part of that is, and I also certainly talks about this, is developing the, the capacity to really listen deeply, to make the time to listen deeply, to hear another person, and to ask questions, you know, that, that really um, investigating that. And, uh, you know, so much of sort of white culture or so much is, is about people saying, no, I'm just not comfortable with that, as if comfort is the, the primary uh, value in all things. So this is also about learning to have some discomfort ourselves. And then um, in some circumstances, really work through that discomfort with someone else with a lot of respect, humility, curiosity, and, and this intention of uh, really being curious about what is um, the best thing for this other person's well-being. How do we do that? Oh, hi, thank you. Um, yes, yes, that's very interesting. Um, maybe I will also read that book. Sounds very good. Um, and I want to say a couple of things. One is, um, so I don't know anything about the California case and I can't imagine being a parent in that situation. Um, I think you mentioned it was a mother. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is a movie which is very good and I'm just going to mention it because I like it it's called The Soloist mm -hmm. and it's not about a parent or a relative in a similar situation um, but it is about someone who does try to help someone in the situation that you described the child was in mm -hmm. um, and I just think it's a very good movie um, although again I'm not saying that this every it it's um different in every case which is why i'm glad you're we're discussing this because then we just have to think about every individual case and then we also have to think about as you're saying with humility um do we actually know what's in the best interest of someone else you know we have to make sure before we do something that we actually you know know that or have thought it through that it's in someone else's best interest. Um, and then I was going to say another time you had mentioned vulnerable people, and this is just an example. It's not a personal example, but must come up quite often when someone has Alzheimer's or something and a child has to make a decision and there are no good decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, does the parent go to a nursing home or not? And so it all requires so much thought and, as you said, humility, like what is actually best among alternatives. So I just wanted to thank you. I thought that was great. Thank you, Diane. When uh, one of the things that I have taken heart from um, is the idea that there are sometimes just terrible situations where there is, you know, no no good choice. Things are really tragic and there's no good choice. There's no fix. We can't fix it. But so often we can make it less awful and we make it less awful by showing up, by being present, 
by being kind. Um, when I mean, there are times when people just face wrenching decisions, and there there is um, no no happy outcome at all. When there are just the hard, awful things are awful, and there's no way to fix it. Um, but sometimes, because there's no way to fix it, you know, we just pull back. And and I really believe. Uh, that even in the worst situation, we can often make it less awful just by bringing our loving attention, our our companionship that we we companion people through the very difficult, terrible, terrible things, um, and um, so that's. Um, I have been thinking about that. There that was a, um, a an article that I've been discussing with some Dharma friends about you know what happens when things collapse when there's a catastrophe, and it says no, there is no is no fix. And they took Katrina, what happened during Katrina, as an example, but you know to to make the best decision you can to be there to be present um, and um, and not to not to underestimate um, how in terrible situations, just showing up, being kind, being present can really make an, an enormous difference because we're a caring species. You know, to show up and just care, to be with, to companion, um, that is um, some of the most important um, work that we can uh, can do, but I think sometimes it's so hard when when there is no fix that you know that the the sort of failure of that just becomes overwhelming. Instead of thinking, okay, there is no fix. What can I do in this situation? How can I be in this situation? And it's really to show up again as a caring uh, a caring human being. We can care for each other no matter how awful it is. Yeah, I just wanted to say I have been the recipient of that kind of love and care. And um, specifically from you, Patrice, and it is life changing. And, and it's so it would be so easy not to in a situation that's so horrible to like somebody just said, you know, that we shouldn't force ourselves on people, but gent your gentleness and coming back again and again and just not having to do anything big, but just being there made all the difference in my life. And I think that um, I'm appreciative of the fact that, that you were willing to do that for me. I don't mean to make, make it all personal and everything, but that's probably one of the best examples I have of in my life of that that occurring to me and um it really makes a huge difference in in a time where there's no fix you know and so i just want to validate what you're saying one and and thank you also <laughs> oh thank you amy thank you very much i just want to say it's, it's for amy ditto for me as well um, Patrice has been there for me as well. Thank you, Robert. Wow, that's really beautiful to hear. I mean, you know, here you are talking of community, Patrice, and your community's here with you. So that's just, and, you know, I just love how you broke it down because it can seem like, you know, the, the, catastrophes are so big, you know, and it's just to break it down. And, and that's, I think that's um, part of our practice too, to be in the moment. What, what, how can you just be in this moment? What can you do in this moment? Mm -hmm. You can't fix everything. Um, but so that was just lovely to hear that little echo echo. 
from my heart. At the end of the Buddha's life, um, it wasn't like in the paintings that you see of everyone around him and it was, you know, everybody feeling devoted and inspired. The Buddha was kind of on the run at the end because the politics had changed. The two kings who were his friends, they were both killed by their own sons and um, there had been division in the Buddhist community, the Buddha's cousin, Devadatta, uh, had caused this great schism in the community by claiming that the Buddha, he wanted to become the Buddha's successor. And he said that the Buddha wasn't kind of strict enough that the Buddha, you know, all the monks should have to be vegetarians. And the Buddha said they can be, but you know, the teaching was sort of to eat whatever was offered. But he said, you know, I'm not saying they can't. And he thought they should only wear really, really awful old robes. And um, the physician, who was a king's physician, who talked to the Buddha, said, you know, getting rags out of the charnel grounds is not, is not healthy. If people want to give the monks robes, they should be able to accept like clean robes. And the other thing David Dada said, well, they should never sleep under a roof. Everybody has to sleep outside. The Buddha said, people want to sleep outside, they can sleep outside, but they don't have to. The monks don't have to. So there's this great schism where all the really hardcore, not all, but many hardcore guys like left. And um, some of them came back, but the Buddha was, was ill. Um, he died sick and painful death. Um, he was equanimous, but he was in, in pain. And uh, he died in a really inauspicious place. And a lot of people thought, oh, he, you know, she should have died in like a big city, someplace that was on the map, not kind of on the run. So when the Buddha died, it was, um, things were not looking good. His two chief disciples had died shortly before him. He decided not to appoint a successor. You know, things were, were really grim. And, you know, despite that, um, the teachings have, have flourished. And I often think about that in times when things are looking grim. Um, we don't know. Um, it's, it's hard to be optimistic. And I think, you know, at the time of of the Buddha's death, it was not clear that this community would continue at these teachings. And actually after he died, a number of monks just left because it wasn't clear if there was going to be a succession, what was gonna happen. Um, there were some sort of opportunistic um, monks who tried to take advantage of the situation. So it was very, it was, it was really a, a politically volatile time and, um, and, and it's sort of interesting that, you know, a lot of the monks were just really ashamed. Of, Why did you die in this backwater, this boondocks, you know, you should have died someplace important. And um, he probably died from food poisoning, dysentery from food poisoning. Um, so it was, um, you know, I, I just pass that story on because I think sometimes when we are discouraged and things seem really bleak, um, you know, we just don't know. And um, and I think it's good to keep this kind of don't know mind. It doesn't mean that we don't do everything we can for justice or to um, preserve the environment, to live sustainably, but this sort of um, don't give up is I think one of the things that I take from, from the Buddhist story of his death that it's, um, you just don't know. So you don't give up. You do what, um, you know, you sort of follow the eightfold path and see where it takes you. So that's, 
Um, that's what I have to offer. So thank you all for being here tonight, and I will end with our um, our sharing of merit, which I just love because you know we get to practice this wonderful act of imaginative generosity and just bring everyone in. So if there's any goodness to our practice, any benefit or blessing or merit, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away, every bit of it. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, our communities. We would share any goodness with those we like and also with those we don't like so much. We would share the merit with the people we know and the millions upon millions of people we have yet to know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would share any blessings with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the scaly, the slimy, and the finny. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs>